Hey, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining uh, this webinar today. Um, we have a very interesting topic today. We thought that you would enjoy. Uh, we're discussing today uh, upper extremity injuries in pickleball. So I know we know that this is a very uh, popular sport, and we see a lot of patients um, with some uh, injuries. So we want to give you some options to treat those. I'm joined by Dr. Rogers. I'm Dr. Muriel Diaz, and um, Dr. Rogers will introduce the, the practice a little bit. Great. Hi. Thanks, Muriel. Um, I'm Dr. Chris Rogers, and I'm the founder of San Diego Orthobiologics, which is a medical practice here in Carlsbad, California. And we're going to tell you a little bit about our practice, and then we'll tell you how to stay out of trouble with pickleball. Mm -hmm. So uh, we started our practice. Yeah, go ahead and start your slides. Second here. Yep, that's correct. There we go. So um, we are now four doctors, as you can see. Uh, all of our doctors are uh, getting older. <laughs> we, we all have at least... Uh, 15 years experience in non-surgical orthopedics. We're board certified in what's called physical medicine and rehabilitation. Uh, we're also uh, fellowship trained, which means um, after finishing med school and residency, we went on to specialize even further. Um, Muriel specializing in um, spine and sports medicine. Uh, Dr. Evangelista is triple, triple board certified and fellowship trained also in spine and sports. And Dr. Ambach is double fellowship trained um, in spine and sports, as well as regenerative medicine, which we will talk more about. Uh, so um, we're really fortunate to have a great team of collaborators and um, innovators. This is our practice in Carlsbad, um, located near the flower fields. And uh, we built this building, I don't know, seven or eight years ago. And it's just been a really wonderful place for us to do our treatments. This is what you see when you come in our office, our nursing station, and then the next slide shows our treatment room. So um, one of the things we believe in strongly is that each patient should be comfortable uh, and, um, and uh, have a visit with a physician, not a physician extender. Um, we obviously, physician's assistants are wonderful and they play their role, but in our office, you always, you always see a physician uh, who has, like I said, many years experience. Uh, this is our procedure suite where we treat uh, patients using either the x-ray guidance on the right or the ultrasound guidance that you see on the left. Um, and we have all the necessary state-of-the-art equipment to provide uh, great care. So I think Dr. Ambach is going to talk a little bit about pickleball now. So um, I'm going to start uh, the pickleball uh, lecture, and then uh, Dr. Rogers will be back to talk a little bit about the regenerative medicine uh, procedures that we offer here in the off, um, for you in the clinic. Um, feel free to add any of the questions that you may have to the question and answer uh, section in the uh, in the bottom of your screen there. And at the end, we'll have a couple of minutes. Um, uh, to dedicate it to answer your questions. So uh, pickleball, I know many of you probably will give, can, could give me a lecture on pickleball, but just a little <laughs> bit of an overview. is the fastest growing sport in the United States right now. Um, so there's a lot of um, patients and, and regular people practicing and joining different um, uh, teams and groups. So uh, it's important to know how you can uh, prevent some injuries. And if you do uh, have some injuries, how to treat it. So in general, it's a paddle-based uh, game. Um, it uses a plastic uh, hollow ball. If you see over here in the bottom, it's similar to the wiffle ball. Um, so this uh, is a game that was a cross, basically a cross between ping pong, badminton, and tennis. So it has a little bit of components, a little bit of everything. Uh, it can be played indoors or outdoors, which is great, uh, especially here in California. Um, and if you see here, you can compare the size of the court between the regular tennis courts and the, let me go back, and the pickleball courts is a quarter size of the tennis uh, court, which give you, um, you know, you don't have to be running around so much, it's a little bit more compact. 
uh, the ball is not as hard, so you don't require that much force. So these um, are a lot of things that that other patients can 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 do and can enjoy. Um, it could be played with two or four players, which is great also for socializing. Um, so it, we understand why it's so popular at this point. Um, unfortunately, there's we have seen an increase in uh, pickleball injuries. Uh, the pickleball uh, injuries have definitely increased um, in the last decade. And even after the pandemic, we have seen higher numbers, even more than the ones that I'm gonna be showing you. 85% um, of these injuries are seen in patients 60, uh, 65 or older, um, 60 or older. So basically is a lot of the, of the population that we see. Uh, the most common injuries in females is gonna be wrist fractures. This is specifically from falls. Uh, that's not necessarily what we treat, but I just wanted to kind of give you that information just to be careful out there. And in males is more sprains and strains. To be honest, most of what we see in generals will be those sprains, strains, tendon injuries in both females and males. Uh, this is an interesting graph that um, there was a study that was done comparing the injuries between pickleball and tennis. Uh, and if you see this graph uh, depict from 2010 to 2019, 2020, um, comparing uh, pickleball and tennis. So if you see pickleball at the beginning, there were not a lot of uh, injuries involved. And now, uh, specifically in the senior population, this has skyrocketed. Uh, there's really high incident of um, injuries with pickleball. Um, this one is comparing more or less the injuries that you would see with regular tennis versus pickleball. Uh, most of them are all going to be uh, strains and sprains. Um, tennis, you're still going to see more injuries in general, but we can see definitely a trend of the pickleball injuries increasing, which uh, we want to try to avoid. So we are going to concentrate on this uh, lecture in upper extremity uh, injuries. Otherwise, we'll be, you know, it will be too, too large of a topic. Uh, most uh, the injuries, um, mostly in the upper extremities, are going to be uh, in the wrist, elbows, and shoulders. Uh, these are going to be either ligament injuries, ligament sprains, uh, sprains, uh, tendonitis, uh, tendon tears, and fractures. Uh, so we're going to concentrate mostly on the soft tissue strains, sprains, and tendon uh, injury. So for us to understand this, it's important to know a little bit about the tendon. Uh, that's most of the what we see here in our practice. Uh, tendon injuries uh, are very common. And depending on the grade of the injury is the type of uh, procedures that we're gonna be offering and type of treatment options. Uh, it's important to know that the muscle itself doesn't attach to the bone. So the muscle kind of converts into this fibrous tough uh, tendon. And then the tendon actually connects to the muscle, to the, to the bone. Uh, so this is the way that the muscle uh, strength is transmitted to the bone. So in terms of to enable, uh, so, so we are able to have some movement. So the tendon itself like takes a lot of load. It's mostly made out of uh, collagen. Uh, so it's important to try to preserve that um, structure. And although it's very strong, it doesn't have a lot of uh, uh, healing capacity. It doesn't have a lot of like blood supply. So it tends to be kind of the, the weaker link uh, to get all those um, injuries. If we see over here, uh, as I said, most of the injuries that we see are tendon injuries. And it's important to kind of differentiate between um, the types of tendon injuries. There could be tendonitis, uh, tendinosis, and then uh, tendon tears. Uh, I know most patients kind of like use them as if they mean the same thing, but it's good to kind of understand uh, tendonitis is more of an inflammation, like an acute inflammation, a new injury. Uh, those are mostly uh, kind of temporary, kind of you overdid it, maybe overstretched and caused some injury to the tendon. And if you see over here in the top uh, drawing, uh, you don't see any kind of changes in the tendon itself. The quality of the tendon is just inflamed. Once you have a lot of those uh, acute inflammatory process, then the tendon itself starts having some specific structural changes. 
And that is where we call it tendinosis. So tendinosis will be already the tendon itself has more chronic changes. It becomes kind of stiff. Uh, it loses elasticity and it's more prone to injury. So those um, tendons that are uh, tendinotic or have tendinosis, then there are more risks for having tears. And these tears can be uh, either partial tears or, tendon, uh, or complete tears. Um, sometimes I describe it to patients like it's like an, uh, a rubber band. When it's new, you can pull it and it comes back to its shape. Uh, and it's kind of very uh, pliable and elastic. If you leave it in a drawer, come back six months later and you pull on it, it's kind of, it cracks a little bit, it becomes stiff, it doesn't go back to its original shape. So that's what happens to the tendon, it, it loses that elasticity. Over here will be more like the tendon tears. And this, uh, I feel these pictures help kind of uh, understand what's going on. Both of these pictures will kind of depict a, a, an example of how tendon tears will look but it could be anywhere from a little bit of fraying of the tendon that you see here on the left. Uh, those can be uh, painful sometimes, more with overuse, but these tendons can degenerate and move more towards like a full tendon tear, um, which is what we would depict with this rope um, picture on your right. So um, it's important to know the tendon itself is very tough. It has many layers. It's not gonna happen from one injury, but once you start having a couple of like, injuries, uh, then it becomes weaker and, and you can develop some tears. Obviously, if it's like a traumatic um, injury, it, it could cause a tear as well. Uh, there's a lot of um, common causes for injuries. Most of these uh, causes are gonna be related to um, things that you can do uh, to change, uh, to avoid this uh, type of injuries. Um, the, that will be lack of proper warm up, just going in and, and playing without like stretching and warming up a little bit. Overuse definitely is one of the things that we see the most. Um, I had a patient that started like playing just like once or twice over the weekend and went up to play like three times a week, uh, six hours per day. So. <laughs> That definitely is a lot. So there's a, definitely that overuse is gonna, you know, have a toll on your um, on your tendons. So it's yeah, important to kind of I uh, see how you can manage that. And also saying, improper. Oh, I'm trying to interrupt you. Sorry. Let's say we have a we have a saying: too much of a good thing is not a good thing, right? So exactly, it's about balance, right? Activity mm -hmm. and rest they have to be balanced. Unfortunately, For more sure. so as you get to be my age and older. <laughs> for sure so, so definitely those those patients that are uh and i understand you know it can be a little bit of a, a addictive uh, uh sport um so but but yeah once that it goes to that point definitely you're gonna see more more chronic uh, injuries and then the rest is more improper technique improper equipment those are um all these things are things that that you can uh change and and make some uh you know, even small changes can make a difference. Uh, I'm just going to talk a little bit about the three most common uh, injuries will be short, uh, shoulder, elbow, and wrist. So for the shoulder, we talked about a little bit before about rotator cuff uh, tears. Uh, the most common one, this is the rotator cuff. Uh, the rotator cuff, four different muscles that help uh, keep the shoulder in place, uh, help with elevation and rotation of the shoulder. Uh, the most common tendon injured is the one here that you see on the top, that's the supraspinatus. Um, the good thing about pickleball is that because you don't do, uh, the serve is underhand, we haven't, at least I haven't seen that many shoulder injuries uh, compared to other uh, like tennis and other um, uh, sports, although we obviously uh, see them, but it's, it's less than in, in other um, uh, sports. But tears, as you know, rotator cuff tears are just just from natural ravages of time are more common as we age. And I tell everybody over 60, when you go to your high school reunion and do an MRI on everyone's shoulder, you know, a third or more of the people will have a tear. So even though the sport is not necessarily uh, creating that injury, um, it could exacerbate a pre-existing cuff tear, right? For sure. Yeah, and, and I think that's uh, because the, the sport requires a little bit of a, 
less intense uh, training and it's easy, easier to pick up. Those uh, tendons that were already there, a little bit like brewing, it can, can be exacerbated for sure, even if, if you don't like overdo it too much. Um, elbow injuries. I feel that this is the most that I've seen with uh, uh, pickleball players. I'm not sure if you have the same experience, uh, Dr. Yep. Rogers. Absolutely. So I feel the elbow injuries are the most common ones that we have been seeing. So many of you have heard about the, the uh, concept of like a ten, tennis elbow, golfer's elbow. Um, basically it's a similar um, injury. It just depends where the injury occurs. So the tennis elbow is usually in the outer part of the elbow. It's called also lateral epicondylitis, inflammation in that area. And that's where the tendons of the wrist extensors attach. So anything that you do like a over uh, extension, a lot of like a wrist extension is gonna, can cause um, pain over that region. Um, golfers are always the same uh, concept, but in a different location. The golfers elbow is more in the inner part of the elbow. And that will be more with like flexion of the wrist because all the muscles and, and tendons that flex your, your, uh, your wrist are going to be attaching to that area, or most of them are going to be attaching to that area. So what happens is that with overextension and overflexion, that's going to keep pulling on that area that you see here in the pictures, and then it's going to cause micro tears um, or sometimes full tears in that region that you can see here in that picture in the circle. And then wrist injuries, we don't see a lot, but we do. Um, uh, see them as well. Uh, again, uh, overuse uh, can cause this, uh, causes inflammation, it causes load in the tendons, load in the muscles, the ligaments, and can cause some of the symptoms that you're having. Um, and then just be very careful with those falls because that can cause some of specific uh, fracture. Uh, the conservative treatment is usually rest, eyes. Uh, many of you are familiar with this type of brace. Uh, this will be for those tennis or golfer's elbow that will uh, release or, or decrease the load of those tendons. Uh, physical therapy is something that we always recommend as part of uh, recommending in most of the treatments that we do in combination with physical therapy. Analgesics, it could be either topical or um, anti-inflammatory medications. All these things are going to be helpful to the, to, uh, at some level. But if that doesn't help, then we have to go to a little bit of like bring in the, the big guns. How to prevent uh, injuries. So proper warming with warm up. We spoke about that already. Start slow. Listen to your body. If you feel that you're starting to have aches, pains and kind of, uh, you know, the body is pretty, uh, pretty smart. So it will give you some signs that, that you're we're doing it. And at that point, you have to go back, revisit your, your equipment, the proper form, and see if there's anything that you can uh, alter. Um, also, it's important exercise recovery. So the rest, uh, exercise in general, um, to get ready for, for that conditioning that the, the game will require. So now we're uh, gonna be uh, talking about the specific treatments that we can offer when all these conservative treatments um, are not sufficient to give you some pain relief. Thanks, Dr. Diaz. Um, I just wanted to add, a lot of our patients will ask us questions and they'll, they'll often say, you know, my shoulder or my elbow was bothering me, but I thought it would just get better. And that's because you're so used to your body getting better. We're, we're so blessed to have this amazing body that has this innate ability to heal. And for, you know, for many years, it wasn't completely understood how that occurs. We're going to talk a little bit about that right now. But um, before I make that point, I want to make the point that when people uh, feel soreness the next day, that's one thing, right? Everyone's had that experience where if you over exercise, the tissues become swollen, inflamed, and usually don't feel till the next day. If that persists uh, for a couple of weeks, maybe there was a minor injury, but that can still mend itself. It's those people that the pain just persists or more commonly, it'll sort of wax and wane for months where uh, they'll think they're better, but then as soon as they're active again, they'll feel the pain again. Those are the patients that most likely have these sort of these occult tears in their tendon that are most amenable to what I'm going to talk to you about right now, which is regenerative medicine. So regenerative medicine is a branch of medicine that, that did not exist when Dr. Diaz and I were in medical school. 
and it's an evolving field. And it basically is based on the premise, of course, that the body does have this innate ability to heal itself. Uh, the next slide we show, uh, we talk about this term orthobiologics. Our company is called San Diego Orthobiologics. What does that mean? That means we're using these cells that are involved in the healing process as a treatment, as a, as a therapy, as medicine, essentially, to uh, help facilitate healing in parts of the body that are having a little trouble healing. So it's really no different than thinking about your lawn, which maybe isn't growing as well as you want it to. So you throw a little fertilizer and then things start to perk up. So the, the cells that are most that you most commonly hear about are the platelets and stem cells. Uh, and then there are molecules that are manufactured by these cells, such as growth factors, uh, exosomes, cytokines, proteins. These are all medical terms that are, uh, and there are many, many more, of course, but these are uh, essentially the, the concept that you have these cells that are manufacturing molecules that are necessary to facilitate that healing process. So the first thing we talk about is platelet-rich plasma. What is plasma? Well, that's the liquid component of your blood. So it has hormones and electrolytes and proteins and uh, antibodies, all kinds of things floating around in the fluid. And then, of course, you have cells. You have red cells, which carry oxygen and carbon dioxide. You have white blood cells, which fight infection and are also involved in the healing process. And then you have these little guys called platelets, uh, which normally look like little plates till they get angry, and then they grow those little spikes, and that's where they release their growth factors out of. Next slide. Uh, so, so platelet is essentially a first responder to an injury. So you see a cut there in a blood vessel, and that platelet is going to stick to the blood vessel and um, start to aggregate and form a little clot, and then it starts squirting out little growth factors that uh, are going to call stem cells and other cells to the area to help finish off that healing process. And on the left, there's actual electron microscopy of little platelets uh, forming a little clot together. Uh, and these platelets secrete thousands of different types of proteins and cytokines and glycoproteins and different molecules that are important for the healing process. In general, we just call them cell, cell fertilizer because they stimulate growth. Um, we really understand well, maybe 20 or 30 of these growth factors, which means there's a lot more learning for the, this field of regenerative medicine to learn. Um, but essentially they function to decrease inflammation. They will stimulate cells to differentiate or proliferate. Differentiate means to say you have a immature progenitor cell turn into a tendon cell or turn into a cartilage cell. Uh, those cells then proliferate and then uh, help regenerate tissue. Uh, they also uh, these these growth factors also stimulate the formation of new blood vessels, uh, and that's different than increasing circulation. Right, you run on a treadmill, your blood flow increases. We're talking about actually adding irrigation system to the injured area. So we told you a tendon doesn't have very good blood flow, so these growth factors help uh, generate new blood vessels in the area. And then they recruit stem cells to the injury site, which are useful for healing. How do we make the platelet-rich plasma? Well, we take some blood and we spin it in a centrifuge. And you'll see when you do that, the heavy items, the red cells, which contain iron, will drop to the bottom. And then in the middle, the platelets are concentrated. And then the liquid component, the plasma, floats on top. And we can mix and match. Yep, you're good then we can mix and match to um, make different kinds of PRP. So I'm sort of on this um, soapbox lately because I hear a lot of people saying they have talked to someone who does PRP or they heard somebody does PRP. And I want people to understand that not all PRP is created equal. A friend of ours, Dr. Magalon, did this great study where he donated his blood to um, be used in a study where, in this case, seven different centrifuge systems were used to make that company's version of PRP. And you can tell just looking at the finished samples there, they're all very different. And um, in some case, <laughs> I don't know if you can hear the squeaking, somebody's doing some work <laughs> outside my room here. Uh, but if you look at the samples, you'll see some of them are very clear yellow and others are almost dark red like blood would look. And that's because the ratio of plasma to platelets to red cells is different depending on which treatment protocol 
is being used. And we're learning that certain treatment protocols are better than others. And your doctor needs to understand this. Otherwise, they might be using a PRP that is inappropriate for your specific condition. And worst case scenario, they may actually be making something that's not actually PRP. It's not concentrating the platelet count high enough to be therapeutic. So you don't get enough of those growth factors. Next sample, or yep. So what do we do? We, we actually measure our final product. So when we centrifuge your blood, uh, we compare the PRP that we made to the blood sample that we took to make sure that we are getting the appropriate number of platelets uh, in your treatment. And so that's what you see our technician there uh, measuring the platelet count in the cell. And I'm pretty sure we're the only clinic in San Diego that does this currently. And I tell everyone your PRP should look like this. <laughs> It looks kind of like mango juice or pineapple juice. It should not look like cranberry juice or blood, especially if you're injecting into a joint, because we know that red blood cells are not helpful for uh, cartilage, actually can damage the cartilage. So we want to make sure that the red, all the red cells are removed, and all that's left is the plasma and the concentrated platelets. And also, uh, uh, I would like to emphasize that PRP is not a product. A lot of people advertise PRP on their websites as if they're selling a drug or a product, when in reality, PRP is a service, very much like surgery is a service. It, you need a skilled technician, someone like Dr. Ambach there who has 20 years of experience using that ultrasound machine so she can look into your knee joint and put the appropriate PRP in the appropriate location safely and comfortably. And most important of all, into the right person. Some people are not PRP candidates. And it's a waste of their time, energy, and money to even consider PRP. And having a doctor with 20 plus years experience gets you ahead of the game. So it's a service that we provide. Next. So, okay, I'm getting off my soapbox and I'm getting back into the research here. So real quickly, let's talk about PRP uh, versus steroids for rotator cuff tendon tear. So when I graduated medical school, uh, I was very excited to learn how to inject tendons into rotator cuff tendons and in, uh, I'm sorry, steroid in the rotator cuff tendons and into bursa and so forth. And um, we now know that there, we have better options. Uh, and of course, PRP is that better option. So in this case, we have a level one randomized controlled trial where 32 patients with a partial tear of the rotator cuff tendon were either injected with um, steroid or PRP. And what did we find? Well, we found that the amount of improvement uh, in pain and the amount of improvement in function was better in the group that received PRP. And uh, we found really very little change in the steroid group. Now patients will respond in the short term to steroids, but if you start looking at them at three, three six or 12 months, you're really not gonna see the benefits uh, from steroid like you do with PRP. And uh, so in this study at six months, they assessed pain on a, a zero to hundred scale and the average Pain was what, 14 for the PRP group, and it was 37 for the uh, steroid group. So not as effective. And of course, they showed that PRP was safe. Next slide. Um, tennis elbow, uh, I actually treated my first tennis elbow patient in 2008. At that point, there was only one published paper. Now there are dozens of uh, published papers specifically for PRP in tennis elbow, showing that it's safe and effective at uh, improving pain and improving function. And um, in another webinar, I think we'll show you some before and after pictures, pretty impressive to see the actual healing of the tendon uh, in a lot of these patients. And um, all these papers, uh, we have this on our website, you can look it up. Uh, all these papers show that PRP is essentially superior to uh, steroid injections uh, uh, for tennis elbow. So please uh, consider uh, the option of PRP. And frankly, I think that there's more evidence showing that injecting steroid into tendon is a bad idea because it has a, um, what they call a, a catabolic effect so that it, it actually can inhibit the tendon's ability to heal. And I feel more, many pa more patients are uh, more informed now. Uh, many patients come like, I don't want to have any more steroids. I had them in the past and Although they provide limited uh, benefits, I know it's not healthy for the tendon. So I, I think a lot of uh, patients are getting more informed. Yeah, that, that's, uh, we're seeing that change for sure. 
Uh, this is a um, actual before and after picture, and I, I don't expect you to be a radiologist, but what you're looking at is an ultrasound image of the rotator cuff tendon. So that tendon on top of the shoulder, the one that's commonly injured, the supraspinatus. Uh, the arrow is pointing on the top picture. The arrow is pointing to an area where there's a black hole. Uh, there's a hole there because the tendon has been injured. The fibers are retracted and there's fluid in that space. And um, that's and that's a painful rotator cuff tear. Uh, four months after treating, and by the way, this doesn't always happen, but often we see this where if you uh, treat that patient with PRP uh, and come back and look with ultrasound, that black hole now looks more white and fuzzy, which means that uh, tendon fibers have grown, uh, that the tendon uh, tear is decreasing in size and in some cases actually completely heals. Uh, this is actually my first patient I ever treated. I told you in 2008, this was a uh, professional golf instructor who had tennis elbow. And uh, you're looking on the top there, that first image um, where the little white star is, is showing there's a tear in the tendon. Uh, in addition, the tendon is swollen. You can see the two uh, yellow plus signs are, are further apart than the image below. And that's because the tendon was torn and swollen. Uh, and I injected PRP into his tendon. Uh, and that was PRP 1.0, by the way. I think we're on PRP 8.0 now. So it keeps improving every couple of years. Um, but nonetheless, even in that very crude uh, early uh, version of PRP, the um, uh, patient was able to show healing of the tendon. You can see the swelling is decreased six months later. You see that the black hole now is starting to fill in with white tendon fibers, and those fibers are attached to the bone. So now you have a less painful, uh, fully functional tendon. And uh, I'm friends with this gentleman, and now we're however many years, 14 years later, 15 years, and uh, yet we're still friends, and also his elbow still feels good. So um, I tell folks, if if and when tendons heal, uh, it's a it's as, as close to a cure as we have in medicine. There aren't many cures in medicine, but this is one of those where when the tendon heals completely, uh, it's essentially a cure. Oh, yeah. Oh, there's the hole. There they are. <laughs> Before and after. Thanks, man. <laughs> uh, and, and I just tossed this in there because the area where PRP has been most studied is neosteroarthritis. And, 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 and uh, we have multiple studies showing that PRP is superior to steroid. PRP is superior to hyaluronic acid. Uh, and it works well if we catch you early, if we, you know, if we catch people in the early phase, mild to moderate works better. We do use it for severe cases as well, uh, but it's going to be more effective for those, those uh, earlier cases. Um, one quick note is patients always ask, well, if there's, you know, three dozen randomized placebo controlled trials showing that this is a safe and effective treatment, why won't insurance pay for it? And the answer is, if you looked at that earlier slide, uh, there's more than 64 ways to make PRP and it's not yet a standardized um, treatment. We're trying to change that. We're collecting data to help uh, insurance companies understand the difference, but it's going to take us some time to get there. Uh, okay, this will be a very short lecture on stem cells. Um, uh, stem cells are a very complicated topic, but essentially what you're looking at there is uh, what's called a pericyte or a, a progenitor uh, mesenchymal stem cell or medicinal signaling cell. It goes by so many different names, so don't try to Google it. But um, over the years, we've learned more and more about that little cell, that little purple cell that you're looking at. He's clinging or she is clinging to a blood vessel. These are tiny microscopic blood vessels that are everywhere in your body. And they're designed to respond to trauma. So if you stub your toe, break a bone, uh, any disease process, these cells are involved in uh, the healing mechanism that we have taken for granted all these years. Uh, stem cell therapy is um, uh, not yet an FDA approved treatment, um, but like I said, we're learning so much more. This is uh, Dr. Kaplan, a friend of ours who uh, first described uh, the mesenchymal, what he called the mesenchymal stem cell in the 1990s, and now he calls the medicinal signaling cell, and he calls it a medicinal signaling cell because it releases, uh, very much like the platelet does, it releases molecules that have many different functions. They can reduce inflammation. They can modulate an overactive immune system. Uh, they can um, help prevent cells from dying. They can help regenerate tissues. 
uh, and they can differentiate into different cell types. So it has many superpowers. Um, currently, stem cell therapy is not approved by the FDA. And therefore, uh, well, what I will call pure stem cell therapy, so where all you're getting is a little vial full of stem cells, uh, requires um, FDA clinical trials be completed. However, we do know that the, these cells are abundant throughout our body. So by simply uh, collecting either bone marrow or adipose tissue, we can get a significant number of stem cells, obviously more in adipose tissue than you would find in bone marrow. Uh, but um, both these tissues uh, contain these cells. Uh, it's just that we're not pulling them out, extracting them, concentrating them, and then bottling them like we do with our research uh, studies. But here's a case where a patient presented with a very large rotator cuff tendon tear, uh, so large that I said, you should go talk to a orthopedic surgeon, which she actually had already and decided that he did not want surgery um, as he was still competing. Uh, and so I, I decided that PRP was not gonna be sufficient for his large tear. And so on the left, what you see, this is probably four or five years ago now, uh, we can see a large tear in the tendon. The, uh, the little arrow is pointing to the tip of a needle, which I placed in the patient's tendon tear and then injected fat that I had collected from his waist area through a simple liposuction procedure. And by doing some minimal processing in a manner that is consistent uh, with FDA current FDA guidelines uh, and using an FDA-approved device, we, I was able to put what I would call an adipose tissue graft into the tear and was really shocked because this is the first time I had ever seen this uh, a year later that the tendon had nearly completely healed. This was a large retracted rotator cuff tendon tear. Mm -hmm. So, um, and his pain pretty much was gone in two months and he was playing professional golf at two months and actually winning tournaments. Uh, but I didn't look at it till he came back in town a year later uh, with a different problem, the, the other shoulder. <laughs> and I said, hey, let's take a look. And I was just shocked to see how much of that tendon had healed uh, for such a massive injury. Uh, all right, so that's that case. And then next, okay. And then real quickly, I'm just gonna talk about this little machine that's our newest fun toy that uh, mm -hmm. we uh, now have here in our sound spa. That's where I'm sitting in our sound spa uh, that I call it. Um, using sound waves to also stimulate tissues to heal. So we can, uh, it's, it's interesting to me that your torn tendons, your damaged cartilage, your injured bones respond not only to the chemicals released by platelets and stem cells, but also respond to sound waves uh, of different frequency and different intensity. And so shockwave, which has actually been around for decades, is a little bit new to the United States and um, but there's a robust published scientific literature showing that it's safe and effective for many orthopedic conditions. And uh, so we use that now as an adjunct tool uh, for many of our uh, for many of our patients with pickleball injuries. Next slide. Uh, this is a, a published paper uh, from a couple of years ago where uh, uh, what they call high energy shockwave. So there's different types of shockwave. We'll, we'll cover that in another lecture, perhaps but where high energy shockwave was used to treat patients who had had calcium deposits that had developed in their rotator cuff tendons. And basically the groups were, uh, two groups of patients were divided into either a shockwave plus physical therapy or a physical therapy group. And what we showed that, what they showed was that the, the high energy shockwave uh, was more effective at um, not only improving pain and function, but actually would decrease the size of that calcium deposit within the tendon. Um, so this is not a this is not an uncommon condition that we run across where patients will have um, chronic tendon disease uh, characterized by deposition of uh, hydroxyapatite and calcium deposits. <coughs> Excuse me. And then finally, one more study, uh, and then we're going to take your questions and answers. I mean, take your questions and we'll give the answer. <laughs> well, if you have answers, we'll take those too. Uh, <laughs> This is a um, comparative study that looked at um, shockwave and tennis elbow uh, and did a meta-analysis, basically of five randomized, randomized controlled trials. And again, showing that for tennis elbow, shockwave was uh, effective at reducing pain, improving function, improving uh, grip strength, 
Uh, and um, so it's just a tool that we find again and again has more and more uses uh, than we ever thought possible. Okay. Great. So thanks for your That's attention great. there. So what questions have you got? Let me go back and stop my share so I can take a look at those. There we go. Okay. So I have a question here. What have you found to be the average time after PRP for shoulder uh, for patients to return playing pickleball? Average time uh, after treatment to return to sport uh, is dependent upon the severity of the injury and the general fitness of the patient. So we customize it pretty much, but in general, on average, uh, for a moderately severe injury in a 65-year-old, I generally don't let them back to sport for probably a minimum of a month. It could be as long as two, two and a half months. Uh, getting any athlete to not do their sport for any length of time <laughs> is always a battle. <laughs> but uh, particularly for the, uh, for the shoulder injuries, the rotator cuff tendon injuries, they seem to take a little bit longer till um, patients are able to stress them without any repercussions. That's all right. I have another question here. Is shockwave useful for torn rotator cuff if you don't get injections? Um, so we have been seeing some good results with shockwave. Uh, most of the patients that we do PRP or plate rich plasma or any other injection, um, we started recommended uh, most of them follow up with shockwave because we have seen such much uh, improvement and, and faster results when you do both. Um, it's going to depend on the severity of the tear. Uh, some patients do improve with shockwave on its own. Um, it depends on the, the severity. I did have a patient that the plan was to do a shockwave, calm it down, and then do the injection, and she ended up canceling the injection, and that's perfectly fine with us. If, if that's the, the case and that helps you out, that's great. Uh, shockwave usually will require more than one session. Usually is like one um, session a week for four to six weeks. Uh, so it's more uh, like a slow process compared to what the more potent injection could do. But definitely, it's something that we could uh, that that could give you significant benefits even on its own. Yeah, and that's something that we continue to collect data on. I think many of you know that we use the data biologics registry to track all our patient outcomes. And um, I was actually going over with our um, with our support team, who's now incorporating uh, AI and machine learning into our database. So we have you know almost fourteen thousand patients in the database, and we're getting to the point where we can say, okay, if you're of a certain age, you know, if you type in your age, your gender your height, your weight, how long you've had your injury, and then your doctor enters the severity of the injury based on the imaging, we can, with different treatments, uh, get a sense of which, which pathway is the most appropriate for you. So for some of those patients, it may just be PRP. For others, it may be a different kind of PRP. For some, it may be PRP plus uh, shockwave. And um, so we're, this is really exciting to start seeing some of the early data. I just saw it this morning. And um, and uh, being able to really get that personalized and um, data driven approach, I tell I told my team I said you know this is going to enable a young doctor fresh out of training to think like an old doctor like me you know because mm -hmm. I you know thirty years experience I've seen thousands and thousands of people so I can think when I see that patient I can say oh you remind me of you know this patient I saw five years ago whereas a young doctor doesn't yet have that experience but they can go into that database and type in that information and then get a sense of whether they're a good candidate for this or that. I think it's going to be a really helpful tool. Yeah, it's definitely will be helpful to, uh, and also to decide what to do and what treatment to offer. Uh, so it's yeah. a great tool. Yeah, it's all um, about making informed decisions. Sure. This question here, physical therapy exercises, are they different after PRP versus a steroid injection? Um, so, well, Dr. Diaz, what do you know about what happens to a tendon when you put PRP in it versus when you put steroid in it? 
<laughs> so basically it's a very completely different process. So the, the PRP itself it will regenerate the tissue and tendon. Um, the steroid is toxic to the tendon. So it can be toxic to the cells. It can uh, increase the risk of uh, rupture uh, down the line. So uh, yeah. they're very different injections, although both are intended supposedly to decrease inflammation, they're very different um, ways of doing it. Yeah, I think there's some good evidence that um, if you add tensile load, so if you stress the, the tendon, you put, you know, if, if it's your elbow, just lifting weights maybe, um, uh, then the PRP, I think, has a quicker and better effect. So I actually encourage patients to be as active as possible without bumping up against the risk of exacerbating the injury. Whereas with steroids in the past, I would ask the patient to just be completely inactive mm -hmm. because I was concerned that, like you said, you put a steroid in the tendon is toxic. It's what we call cytotoxic, it's harmful to the cells. There's numerous studies that show this and there's potential risk of rupture if you now load a tendon that is impaired like that. So I, I would have probably hold a patient off, you know, for months after a steroid injection. At least that's what we used to do back in the day. And we do have a specific protocol to follow uh, following the PRP injections. Uh, we give you very specific instructions how to follow that after the injections, right? week one, week two. And we provide that information to your physical therapist. Uh, so they follow that protocol that we worked on um, to st start increasing that load to the tendon, to the joints, and uh, the area that was treated. Yeah, anybody who's had an injury understands there's phases you go through, right? So the first phase is like, oh my God, what have I done? Mm -hmm. And then, and it's all about controlling pain and helping you get a decent night's nice sleep and controlling the immediate inflammation. Inflammation is not a bad thing. Inflammation just means you've alerted your healing mechanisms to attract more cells to the area and fluids to the area, which is why things swell. Uh, but you don't want that inflammatory process to go on and on and on. You, after a while, the immune system needs to calm down. The regenerative cells need to take over. Uh, and in the early phases, the tissues are somewhat fragile, even though they're mending. And they really don't get robust until about three to six months. And there's some evidence that shows that, at least in the case of a tendon, that that healing, that what we call remodeling, where the tendons are just getting thicker and stronger, uh, can take years uh, till it's till it's completely healed. Doesn't doesn't mean you're hurting for years, but it just means you know you're not the tissue the, the tissue is not normal for that period of time. So um, and some people heal quickly, and other people heal slowly, and that's influenced by a variety of factors, which is why we strongly recommend that these treatments be. Uh, you know, done in conjunction with a physician who basically, this is all we eat and sleep. This is our, we have no life. This is what we do. <laughs> this is what we do. We study this field. And uh, because, you know, healing is hard enough for some of these injuries and uh, we want to make sure everything's in your favor. Um, I have a lot of patients uh, that ask how long, uh, when did they, will they start seeing some benefits from the PRP? And I think it's important to uh, have like an idea of what we're doing with the PRP itself. Because um, some patients, uh, as we talked about steroids before, the steroids, you will see benefits quicker, but it's not gonna last. And you run the risk of uh, injuring the tendon to, uh, or even rupturing the tendon at, at some point. Um, it's important to know the PRP itself is gonna take time to, to heal. So it is basically, we're giving the body the instructions, the, the equipment, the like well, everything that it needs to heal, but then uh, that's going to come from the body. That it's going to be a healing process. So a lot of this healing can take up to two, three months to see the full benefits. It's not that you're not going to see any benefits uh, until like three months mark, uh, but it's going to be like a, a, a progressive uh, improvement as opposed to like a very quick one that doesn't last. Yeah, it's really kind of fun to see the discoveries that patients make along the way. So, you know, the first thing you usually hear them say is, well, it used to just ache all the time and now it doesn't do that. You know, I can sleep at night, that kind of thing. 
And then the next thing you'll hear them say is, well, I wasn't able to do, you know, fill in the blank. If it was a mm -hmm. knee, I wasn't able to walk, you know, a half a mile, or if it was an elbow, I wasn't able to pick up a cup of water or something like that. And then they'll say, I can do that now and it doesn't hurt. And then, you know, just, you just keep hitting milestone after milestone as you get through that healing, uh, through those different healing phases. It's always and fun. Many patients also notice that they're like, they were taking like Advil, Leaf, Motrin every single day. And they noticed that they just take it when they went on a long hike or they actually play a full like uh, pickleball um, game and it got a little bit irritated. Um, so, so that's something important too, to decrease the, the amount of medications that you use and the possible side effects from, from these medications as well. Um, so, so that's a good thing about this type of uh, procedures themselves. Yeah, which is why we're so excited about the, you know, learning about them and then figuring out how to put them to good use. That's, you know, that's, that's the art of medicine and the science is evolving very quickly. You know, like I said, when I first started doing PRP back in 2008 or so, um, you know, very few papers published. And now, you know, I have a stack on my nightstand every night that's about you know, 15, Thank 20 you, papers Mike. that I'm trying to get through. And, you know, and we're specialists, right? We're just focused on this little narrow field. And yet still, there's so many interesting papers coming out all the time. And we're learning and new insights that we're gaining into how to make these therapies work better and better. So, um, yeah. So anyway, so that is just a great tool. Um, I myself have had four PRP injections. My wife's had eight. You're too young to have any, I think. I haven't <laughs> done them yet, but my knees yeah, are you're too pain. young. You're not falling. <laughs> yeah. falling. You're not falling. <laughs> But clearly, uh, uh, there's a lot of reasons for us to be excited, <laughs> to be excited about these treatment options, especially, have, you, know, you know, I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, I have seen like in, in general, um, it's for whatever reason, the, the patients that undergo adipose uh, tissues, I have seen that they see benefits a little bit sooner than the PRP uh, patients. Yeah. I'm not sure if that's your case as well. Uh, yeah, which is interesting because usually, you know, the most one of the common questions we get is when do you do PRP? Right. When would you do some a tissue that has stem cells like bone marrow or adipose tissue? And I think that's something that we're all still trying to figure out. But I think my experience now, having done this for uh, using bone marrow and adipose tissue for over eight years, is that uh, you're that we use them for more severe injuries. Uh, you know, PRP has been shown to be effective for the more mild to moderate injuries, although we do use them for some severe injuries as an anti-inflammatory a lot of times. Um, but the, but you're right. My experience, uh, one of the things that I've spent a lot of time learning about adipose tissue is, uh, it does seem to work better. It seems to work quicker and it seems to last, it definitely lasts longer. I actually have data on this when you're talking about knee arthritis patients, um, you know, and, uh, uh, I'm not sure I understand why it works so much more quickly, but um, you know, if you think about it, our typical, uh, we call it MFAT, microfragmented adipose tissue, right? So our typical MFAT case, say, is a large rotator cuff tendon tear or severe knee arthritis patient. Um, we're probably getting between one to two million of these uh, stem, we'll call them stem cells, these medicinal signaling cells. Uh, when we inject platelets, uh, we're injecting, you know, sometimes 10 billion platelets. So uh, it shows you how much more potent those little stem cells are. are. And part of the reason they're more potent is because they last longer. They hang around in the tissue longer. They can last for three to six months, whereas platelets probably only hang around for a couple of weeks. But of course, the benefits last, you know, months and years because they're inducing this healing response. But um, there's one published paper. It was in Achilles tendon where uh, one group got PRP, the other group got uh, fat injected into the tendon. And at one year, they, both groups were doing very well, but the group that got fat did heal quicker. Uh, not quite half the time. Mm -hmm. There's a, a couple of patients also asking uh, how many injections are they gonna need? Uh, they come from any other, uh, they hear that, um, that someone got like three injections in a row and different things like that. Uh, I know, um, as you said, uh, most of the decisions is gonna based on the severity uh, of the 
of the condition, but also the quality of the PRP. So I feel like uh, with us knowing exactly how many uh, cells we have, we can uh, kind of like bet on, on one good PRP injection, as opposed to just like, you know, let, let's do three and see what happens. But most, you know, if it's really severe and we are trying to do PRP as opposed to other of the bone marrow or the fat um, tissue or adipose derived tissue, um, then, you know, it's, it might be that, that you might need more. Yeah, it's not always, you know, it's the practice of medicine, right? So it's nothing, hardly is it ever 100% predictable, but we're about 85, 90% predictable at that at this point now, particularly with the data that we're, we've been collecting all these years is allowing us to see the trends and who's more likely to need more than just a single treatment. Those, those images that we showed you earlier in the, in the webinar, uh, those were all single treatment. That was just from one treatment. Um, I've had cases where I've had to do multiple injections, but typically that decision is not made uh, until the patient is shown, uh, tendon is showing evidence that it's not quite fully healed. You know, typical scenario uh, would be, you know, the patient comes back at three months, follow up. They say, you know, I'm, I'm 65, I'm 75% better. I can do things. I'm not taking medicine anymore. Uh, but there's still these, you know, one or two things that I'm not able to do yet, like, you know, run five miles or <laughs> play tennis for four hours, whatever. And, you know, and so, um, and then you look at it under ultrasound or MRI, and you're like, yeah, it's better, but it's not there yet. So in those scenarios, you'll give it a little boost. And that seems to take care of it most of the time. I can't think of a case where that's not happened, um, particularly with tendons and ligaments. Um, but like I said, with the data collection, we're going to get better predicting on day one when that patient first comes in on that first consult mm -hmm. to say, yeah, given everything we're seeing here, you're more likely to need two, not one. But I don't know. My, it seems like 92% of the time, one is enough. Yeah. And then uh, there, there's a couple of patients that come in like, oh, I had PRP before, but it didn't help. Uh, but it's very important. As we said, not all PRP is created equal. Uh, then most of, uh, or, or some doctors don't use like any imaging guidance to do the injections. So doing a blind PRP injection, uh, it, it doesn't tell us anything about like if it's gonna work or not. So uh, make sure that you go to a, a practice that uses either ultrasound or fluoroscopic guided injections uh, because that's definitely gonna increase the, 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 the chances that, that it works for you. Yeah, just like everything in life, there's good, better, and best, right? So, mm -hmm. you know, there's some doctors that claim that they can inject without using any kind of guidance. I, obviously, that's misguided. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and uh, we know now that um, the chances of not getting into something as simple as doing a knee joint injection, you know, you have less than 70% chance of getting in the joint if you don't use ultrasound, whereas if you use ultrasound, you're in there 100% of the time. So if you're going to go through all this effort to undergo a treatment that, by the way, is not covered by your insurance, not reimbursed by your medical insurance, then you better make sure you get the best possible care you can get. And that means your doctor has experience, your doctor is trained. This is, this is what they do you know, and have done for decades that they not only know how to use ultrasound, but they've been doing it for a long time. I think Dr. Diaz, Diaz and I have trained hundreds of doctors how to use ultrasound. You know, So this is, you know, this is what we do. Uh, that we make the PRP the right way, that we put it in the right place, and then we make sure the rehab protocol afterwards is the appropriate protocol. All, all those things, like I said, PRP is not a product, it's a service. So that whole service from beginning to end has to happen correctly to get the best pass possible outcome. Sure. Okay, I think that's a great way to close the webinar today. Thanks for not, so much for joining us. And uh, any, any last words? <laughs> Be healthy, exercise. Oh, there's one anonymous question. What's this? Oh, oh there's one much. more. Just saying thank you. Okay, great. Uh, well, we appreciate you taking your time to be with us today. We will post this on the YouTube channel. Just go to YouTube and look up SDOMG. And I think we have 60 different videos now you can watch. And we'll keep making them. Okay, have a great day. Bye-bye. Thank Thanks, Dr. Diaz.